Well, this is the first video of this week and it's the second part of topic 16, which is the last topic of the year 12 material, which means we'll have covered everything by the end of this video um, for the paper one exam next year. Uh, and then we're going to be moving on next week to the beginning of the year 13 content. Um, for the rest of the remainder of this week, we're going to introduce some more statistics. So the second video that I'm going to um, share with you is the correlation coefficients. We're going to have a go at that as well this week. Okay, so this one um, we're moving on to now is classification. So let's get started. Okay, so before we get going on the new part of this topic, the classification, I thought we could do a bit re a bit of recap on exam technique and um, <clears throat> stabilising selection. So I've chosen a question, actually that was on last year's examination, um, to share with you. And I've also got one of our students' responses from the actual exam because they gave me permission um, to, to share those with you. Okay. <clears throat> so, the question is one that is quite familiar to you because it's um, part of the examples that we used in the notes, okay? So what I've done is I've included the graph with the stem and then the question in bold. And then all I've done is snip some AO1 knowledge which would help you to comprehend the graph which is straight from your keynotes. Okay, so scientists collected data on 8, 800,000 human births the data showed the mass of each baby at birth and whether the baby needed to be transferred to the special care unit for very ill babies. <clears throat> and you can see from the trends that those individuals um, that had a birth mass of around about, let me say 3,000 to 4,000 are the mean within that for mode um, we're less likely to have to go to the special care unit okay whereas the two extremes the very very small um, uh, babies uh, birth in terms of their birth mass and the very large babies in terms of their birth mass and a much higher uh, frequency of those babies were transferred to special care at 0.3. So that's what the data shows. <clears throat> and we recognise that to be stabilising selection. But actually the examiner's not asked us what type of selection it is. They've said use that figure to explain how human mass at birth is affected by stabilising selection for three marks. Okay, so People would fixate on the stabilising selection knowledge, yeah? So straight away you see the word stabilising selection. You'd be thinking, well, it occurs when the environmental is stable, the selection pressure is at both ends, it favours the average, eliminates the extremes, reduces variability, and reduces the opportunity for evolutionary change. And that you would have revised that and in the exam would have recalled that of information that was in your keynotes that birth weight in humans was an example of stabilizing selection okay so all that's good knowledge but it actually is just knowledge about stabilizing selection so if you go back to the question they're not asking us to use the figure to to show that this is stabilizing selection they're saying use the figure to explain how human mass at birth is affected by stabilizing selection okay so let's have a look then at the student response okay so the first thing I want you to think about is the two things that the student has been asked to do in yellow they've been asked to use figure five so in their answer we would expect if they're using figure five that they will quote trends and data to support their answer and you can see the full first half of their question this student has done that really well. So they've said babies with extremely low weight and quoted the examples, so from the graph, 
and very high weight have a population frequency of 0.3 being transferred to special care. This suggests these extremes are a disadvantage to the baby. As those with a weight of, and they've actually gone for the mean there, uh, 3,300 grams, have the lowest number transferred to special care unit. So they have used the data to support that stabilising selection is taking place. We're favouring the average, yeah, and eliminating the extremes. Now, the second half of the question, though, if you read it back, is to explain how human mass at birth, at birth is affected. Okay, so they don't really want you to explain the trend more why um, over time this would mean that babies of an average weight are being selected forward so would have the greatest frequency in the population. So explain how, why and in what way human mass is selected for or against. Now this is where this student didn't quite get the question okay so they're an A star student so a really good biology student but when they read that question they now went on to just justify the trend explain the trend and that wasn't quite what they were asked for okay so I said this means the extremes will be selected against the average favoured and therefore over time the range of babies weight values will decrease and so will the standard deviation all of which is true but it is not explaining how the mass is affected by the selection um, in enough detail. Okay, so they wanted some reference to alleles here to get this mark point up. So they've got their first mark point, but there were two mark points in this section that they've not quite got. They were very close to getting one of them. Okay, so if I show you the mark scheme, okay, so having a look at that mark scheme, um, you can see that <clears throat> they've got their first mark point by using figure five, yeah, so quoting data. And you can see there's lots of data that they accepted. But then, really, it's just the detail, okay? So extreme mass babies less likely to survive, reproduce, and so pass on their alleles. So they said that they were being selected against, but not given enough detail. And they did say that the babies with the average mass would increase in frequency. Um, so they nearly got that mark point. They'd have been better just talking about the alleles for the extreme masses decreasing in frequency, and that would have been a clearer answer and ensured they got all the mark points. Okay, so uh, two things to really concentrate on taking away from that. One, of course, is that if you're asked to use figure, a lot of us still are not using, quoting trends, quoting data, using the diagram. If they say use, you won't get a mark. One of the mark points will be tied to you using, following that instruction. Um, and the other is sometimes, you know, we read a question and we misunderstand the question and that's okay. We've just got to keep practicing. The more practice we get, the better. Um, when it comes to selection, it's always a safe bet to talk about alleles. Okay. And we are going to revisit selection again as part of year two. Right. So moving on to today's topic. Okay. So we are doing the second part of topic 16, which is species and taxonomy. Okay, so we're going to talk about classification a lot today. Okay, so classification or taxonomy is a part of biology. It's been part of biology for as long as biology has existed because humans like to sort and categorise organisms into groups. And that is what taxonomy is. It is the science of classification. So this is naming species and groups and placing them into groups according to their shared characteristics. So thinking back to um, 
when a lot of this work might have been done originally. The groupings would have been based entirely on physical characteristics, how many limbs, what type of limbs, whether you have a, whether the organism has a spine or not, whether it has fur, all these things would allow biologists to place them into groups of similar types of organisms. Um, now with modern taxonomy we use DNA technology to enable us to do that and to really group organisms according to their evolutionary history. So those with um, ancestors that they have shared more recently in time would be placed into groupings together um, and the similarities then are in the base sequences of the DNA of their genes. Okay, so that's what this topic's all about. So if you open up your student notes, okay, we are working on page five. Okay, at the top of page five here. Okay, so there's a bit of a recap here of a key definition that we already have met, which is what is a species? Now remember, a species is the smallest grouping uh, organisms fit into. Um, so that group is unique in that it's just one, one type of organism, one population type that occupies that group. And they're a group of organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. So that's the definition. And that's the smallest group uh, within taxonomy, in our taxonomy system. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to have a look first at naming organisms and then we're going to look at the taxonomy um, classification system that we use mostly in biology. Okay, so thinking about naming species. Okay, so the first thing you need to know about names of biological organisms, so these are the scientific names, we use a binomial system. Binomial meaning there are two names as part of the species name. Okay, these names are universal. So that means that if you're a French scientist and a Japanese scientist and an English scientist, we will all use the same species name derived from Latin or Greek um, to talk about the species. And that's very good in scientific communication because obviously we're, if we're talking about a species and we use its species name rather than its common name in um, the, the individual languages, we'll be much clearer in our communication with other scientists. The first name within that binomial system is actually the grouping that organism occupies in the level of the hierarchy called the genus. Okay, so it's its genus name. It tells you what genus it's in. And the second is the specific species name. So let's have a look at some different ones. <clears throat> so one you should be quite familiar with um, is the genus Homo. Okay, so we are Homo sapiens. So our species name is made up of two parts. The first part is our genus grouping and the second is our species grouping. Okay, we named ourselves by the way and um, in Latin that means wise man or knowing man. Okay, now one of our close relatives, though all extinct now, is a second uh, species of the same genus, so the same group of organisms, um, but a different species of that grouping called Homo erectus. Okay, now when I say they're extinct, they're not, well, they, are, they don't exist anymore, but they are one of our ancestors, so we evolved from them, okay? So Homo erectus is the first species of the homus, uh, homo, homo genus that from fossil evidence we believe walked upright and so we named him Homo erectus mm -hmm. over that feature. So the Latin 
names or Greek names do translate some information about the species to which they refer. Okay, so another one you might be familiar with is a bacterial species, so Bacillus. Okay, so that's the genus and that just means rod-shaped bacteria. So that's a really big genus, it's a big group, there's lots of different bacteria that are rod-shaped. Okay, and uh, Subtilis is this one here that when you look down the microscope at it, it's a very thin rod. So this species of rod-shaped bacteria um, is called Bacillus subtilis. Okay, so here are some common names for species on the left hand side. I'd like you to stop the video and see whether you can match them up with this species names on the right hand side. Okay, so pause here, copy them down and have a go. Okay, so you should have done that task now. So Neanderthal man is another one of, well, either our ancestors or another species of uh, the same genus as us. There's a clue. So they are Homo Neanderthalus. Um, so this is a group of, um, so it's a species of the genus Homo, Homo, which is our genus. And we believe they did occupy the earth, uh, regions of the earth at the same time as us. We have different theories about how they met their end. Some people think that species became completely extinct. Uh, because we outcompeted them. Um, but more modern ideas are that we probably just interbreeded with them and they become part of our ancestry. Um, so maybe they weren't quite a species themselves on the you know on their own. More modern ideas might think that they're just were a subspecies grouping and could interbreed with us. But different schools of thought. Okay, so fruit fly, just cilia, mega, mega no blaster. Domestic cat, I think you might have got this one. Yeah, so Felis catus. Dog, again, we named it Canis familius, familiaris. Aris. Um, lion, Panthera leo. So you can see some of the, the words like. Uh, that you're familiar with. Fierce lizard, Tyrannosaurus rex, and the gut bacteria that we, we know about, uh, E. coli uh, at the top. Right, so we know now about naming organisms. So how does the examiner assess this? Well, this is the kind of question you get. Here are the common names of some plant species and here are their scientific names, okay? Now, to really start to comprehend this a little bit better, if I just flash to um, all the groupings for a second, you can see that we're talking about in the names, the bottom two groupings in the classification of an organism. So the species, the single group at the bottom, the group of individuals that can reproduce and produce fertile offspring, okay, they, share a bigger group with a number of different species and the first part of their name tells you that grouping the second part tells you what species they are within that okay so <clears throat> first question what genus does the red clover beyond belong to what's the species name for creeping buttercup and then which two plants are most closely related from their names uh, meadow thistle and cut leaf cranes bill or herb roberts and cut leaf cranes bill okay so stop the video and have a go answering those questions now just using those names okay so it just tells you about the two groupings okay so i'm gonna go through the answer now so make sure you're ready so for the first one and it says, what genus does the red clover belong to? That's just the first part of its name, is its genus grouping, so trifolium. 
for Creeping Buttercup. What's its species name? Well, its full species name, you could give the whole thing, but within there, its species grouping is actually the second part of the name. Okay, so I'll accept the whole name or just the second part is fine. For the third one, this one is where the examiner can really get whether you understand um, the groupings. Okay, so if you look at meadow thistle and cut leaf cranesville, they look like they might be closely related because they've got the same second name, if you like. Okay, but because they've got a different first name, they're not actually in the same genus. Okay, so they are not very closely related. If you look to the other two, Herb Roberts and Cutley Cranesville, they do share the same genus grouping. So if you think about it, these two are in the same genus grouping. So this one here might be the Herb Roberts, whoops, and another species in that genus would be your crave, uh, your cut leave cranes bill. So they're most closely related. Whereas the other two just happen to share the same last name. Okay. Which means they're not in the same genus. So in two different genuses. So they're less closely related. Okay. So if that's still a little bit tricky, it'll make a lot more sense as we look at the overall classification system. So in your keynotes, okay, we've just had a look at the naming, which is just that section there. Just another little key thing to remember. When you're writing scientific names, um, in written words, when you're handwriting them, uh, really you're supposed to underline them. Okay, um, it's something that has gone out of fashion a little bit. But if you type in them, please do use italics. Okay. And you'll see that in the student uh, questions. They're always in italics. And that's good because they stand out as being species names. And you always need to use the species names in your answers if you've been given them. Okay, so we're moving to the bottom of page five to this classification system here. Okay, so this is the groupings that organisms are put into. Okay, so all life on the planet is classified into groups. Okay. So this is our taxonomic classification. This is the most widely used taxonic, taxonic classification system uh, in biology and is used by everyone now. There were a few different ones in use at some times. So how do we classify them? Well, we place organisms into groups, okay, which are called taxa. And these groupings <coughs> are arranged into a ranked hierarchical system. So in other words, we take all life and we split it into just um, a small number of groups. Okay, so actually um, domain, there are two groupings, um, the eukaryotes, the eukaryotic organisms and the prokaryotic organisms. Okay. And then we take those domains and they're broken up into smaller groupings. Okay, so for example, the eukaryotic or eukaryote domain is split up into a number of different kingdoms, the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the fungi kingdom, and the protoctista or pro pro protist, pro well, I can't remember what you call it, protoctista uh, grouping. Okay, that you learned about at GCSE. And then each one of those is broken into, again, a number of different groups and so on. So we've got groups contained within larger groups all the way until we get to the final grouping, which is the species group, that group of organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. There is no overlap. Okay, so organisms found in one grouping um, at that level um, can only be found in that grouping. So you can only occupy, if you are 
an organism. You can only go in the animal kingdom or the plant kingdom. You can't occupy both. So at each level, an organism will have a named group at each level of this hierarchy. Okay, so thinking about one of those kingdoms then, so this is a grouping here. There are particular features that organisms have in that Protoctista category that mean that all these organisms have shared characteristics and they're placed into that kingdom. Okay, it's a very diverse kingdom though, as you can see. So we've got some organisms that can photosynthesize and some that can't. We've got single cell organisms. Um, we've got things like uh, malaria causing um, organisms. So lots and lots of different kinds of protis, protoctis. And so that kingdom is split up into big, uh, smaller groups, which are the phylum. And in those different phylums, there will be different, those groups will have different characteristics from each other. And then each of those is subdivided into uh, groups called classes. And then each of those classes subdivided into orders. And then each of those orders into families, families into genus, and then finally into species. Okay. Now, you do need to remember the taxonomic rankings. Okay. Um, so the second largest one as well is the kingdoms and you kind of have to know those. So the one you're not that familiar with, I've reminded you of, okay? Um, but can you name all the other kingdoms um, with the, it, within the eukaryotic domain? Can you name them? Okay, and do you know anything about them? So we should know some sh shared characteristics generally about the kingdoms, mainly from our cells, knowledge. Okay, I'll show you. So I'm hoping everybody's got the animal kingdom, so an Animalia kingdom, the animal kingdom. Very, very diverse, as you can see. Um, so things that we know about animals, we know about animal cells. Uh, they don't have a cell wall, they have cell membrane. So all these organisms have nuclei in their cells, they're multinuclear, uh, sorry, multicellular organisms, um, and their features of our animal kingdom. Oh, no, I don't want to go there. Uh, plant kingdom, we got that as well. So again, photosynthesis, can photosynthesize, contain chloroplasts, uh, have cell walls containing cellulose. These are things you know about the plant kingdom organisms within that plant kingdom. Uh, the fungi kingdom as well, you know a little bit about that. You know that the cell walls of the fungi are different. They contain chitin. Uh, you also know that they produce these kind of hyphae. These, uh, now these are the ones that are multi-nucleate. Uh, so that means that their cells have more than one nuclei, these hyphae. So it can produce hyphae. Uh, and again, a wide range. You've got single cellular ones all the way to these complex multi uh, cellular organisms like the mushrooms. Okay. And then the protoctista or protist. So we've got four kingdoms that make up the domain, the bigger grouping, eukaryo the eukaryotic. King, uh, domain. We've got also another kingdom, but this kingdom <clears throat> is in a different domain, and this is the bacteria um, archaea. Um, this is the kingdom, again, the one that you know about prokaryotic cells, so don't have nuclei, uh, don't have um, a nuclear membrane, DNA free in the cytoplasm, circular DNA, all those characteristics of cells within organisms of this kingdom you would be expected to be familiar with. Okay, so we can see the arrangement a little bit of those top two levels of the hierarchy for the organisms we are familiar with. So we can see that we've got two domains, the eukaryote and prokaryote domain. And within the prokaryote domain, we've got just one kingdom, bacteria, archaea, which are an ancient kind of 
branch of, of the bacterial um, kingdom. And then we've got in our eukaryotic domain the plant, protoxista, fungi and animal kingdoms. So all organisms will first be classified into those big groups. So they will either be classified into this domain or this domain. And if they're in this domain, they'll be further classified into one of four. And this domain, they just, there is one kingdom. Depending on the classification system you look at, some have multiple kingdoms where the bacteria are split into different kingdoms. Okay, but the one for us is quite a simple classification system. So you need to know the name of each level, each uh, taxa within this classification system. So we've looked at domain, so we know that there are eukaryotes and prokaryotes, so two different domains. We know that there are four kingdoms within the eukaryotes and one kingdom within the prokaryote. Okay, but those are then subdivided down into smaller groupings all the way down the classification system. And you need to be able to recall this ranked system. So it's a good idea to come up with a, an, something to help you remember it. So we've got Donna, Kebab, Prawn, Curry, or Fried, Greasy, Sausages. Okay, so that's one way. So you just create like something to help you remember it. Um, my group really like, uh, like last year, there is a classification map on YouTube, which is very old school, but is very catchy. So there's some songs out there as well. Now you've got to remember the names and the sequence. Okay. <clears throat> the other thing to be aware of is if organisms occupy, for example, the same family, they will have to occupy the same order, class, phylum, kingdom, domain above that. So they'll have shared all the groupings above. But of course, if they are then different genus and different species, they would occupy different groupings below. Okay, because it's a hierarchy. So let's have a look at one of the groupings you'd be really familiar with. Okay, so this is the level of class. Okay, so, and that's the mammals. Okay, so the class uh, ma 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 uh, of mammals means that all mammals on the planet are in the same phylum, the same kingdom and the same domain. So all mammals are eukaryotes, they are animals and they have a spinal cord so they f fit into a, a, um, the chordate there in the phylum. So they occupy the same groupings above, but of course, then as we saw, they're very diverse. And so there are many different orders of mammal and then within those orders, many different families and then within those families, many different genus and within those genus, geni, very many different species. But why have we placed all the mammals we have into that class? So they've got the following shared characteristics. They have her or fur. They have um, the ability to feed milk to the offspring. So they feed their offspring milk. Um, they've got a single boned lower jaw, um, one time tooth replacement, um, three bones in the middle ear, warm blooded metabolisms, a diaphragm and a four chambered heart. Okay, so the ones you know most about the physiology of, etc. Okay, so let's carry on with the most familiar organism and let's look at its overall classification. Okay, so this is us. We are the Homo sapiens. So let's have a look at our classification. So because we're a mammal, with all of the mammals, we share the top um, groupings. Okay, so we're eukaryotic, we're an animal, we have a spinal cord and we're a mammal. Okay, but within the mammal within mammals that class is split into many different orders and the order that we occupy is the order of the primates okay so you can see there the organisms that were categorized within that large grouping then if we move to our family okay you can see that there's a smaller number of more closely related species that were grouped with in our family 
a genus uh, for us. You can spot them in the um, in this picture. This is our, our ancestry. See, there's uh, Neanderthal and Erectus and some other Homo species. Now we're the only ones um, currently on the planet, so we're a bit novel in that way. Um, but you can see that our genus has got other species that are no longer on the planet also classified within it. And then finally, of course, Homo sapien, which is human there at the bottom. Okay. Modern, I should say modern human, because these are human too. So another one that you might think about um, is the reptiles. Okay, so that's a different class to the mammals. So in that uh, class, in that grouping there, it's split and mammals is a different class to our reptiles. Okay, and if we pick a reptile here, you can see that down from that class, um, we've got the, f the order family G, the species above it, we share the same phylum and kingdom as the reptiles, just a different class. So, as you can see, this classification system does give us all information about how closely related organisms are in terms of their grouping. Okay. So, quick recap. What's meant by a hierarchical classification? Write down your ideas on paper in front of you and pause and then... Okay, I'm going to go through. Well, we're putting them into groups, putting organisms into groups. The largest groups are divided into smaller groups. So domains, the largest, species, the smallest. This bit is really important now to add in, if you haven't written it already. There is no overlap between groups, okay? So you cannot occupy two different groups at each level. So you have to occupy just one grouping at each level. And also, as you move down, the organisms within the shared group have more specialised, more specific features. So if you think about our mammal at class level, yeah, there were a number of shared features, but they weren't very specific. As we started to work down towards our family, we could start to see things like opposable thumbs we share with other monkey with monkeys and gorillas and apes, um, eyes at the front of our head. So specific things that are features of our family. Okay, and then when we got to our genus, then again we're becoming more and more similar uh, until we hit our our species. I'll show you that on those pictures there. Okay, so you can see as we're moving down the rankings, organisms are getting more and more similar in the shared features. Okay. So the other thing to think about, so this is for a rabbit, I think. Um, so you can see that as you move down the rankings, you've got an increased similarity between the organisms in those groups, which means that they shared an ancestor more recently in history. Um, but as you go the other way, you get an increase in number of species in each category because the groups are getting bigger. Okay, so I want you to have a go at this task. So um, we have We have um, from an exam question, I think this one was from last year. So you've got the taxonomic group to fill in. Okay, so that's just remembering that order, first of all. So can you copy that down and fill in the gaps? Okay, so to check through this, um, we've got kingdom. So below that would be phylum, class, then it's order, family, genus, species. So we're filling in those gaps. 
Now, they don't have to give us the whole taxonomic grouping. So they start at Kingdom here. They could start at class. And it's just to make it so that you can always uh, still give them in the correct order. Okay. Now, the other way the examiner likes to assess this is using pictures. Okay. Now, hierarchies, people tend to see as a linear uh, picture. So sort of a branch, tr branches of a tree, if you like. But really, when we're thinking about groupings, um, another way of showing it is to show the big group and then the subdivided groups within. OK, so if you think about our tiger and our clothed leopard, OK, the exam board wants us to add additional circles to the diagram and label them to include the information about the tiger and the clouded le leopard. So we've got already that we know they're in the same animal kingdom. They're also in the same phylum, they're in the same class, they're in the same order, the carnivores, and then they're in the same family. So the examiner's done all of that for us. Okay, so now what we've got to add are below. Now they're actually in two different uh, genii. Yeah? So when we're drawing on that, think about what that would look like. And then each of those is subdivided into different species. And of course, um, we haven't got any of the other species that would be present. So what would that look like? So have a go, copy it down. If you're not sure, wait, and you can draw it in with me in a moment. <clears throat> okay, so pause it while you draw the diagram. And I'm gonna go through it now. Okay, so, oops, come back. So what you should have drawn are <laughs> two circles with two little circles within. So let me explain why. So if we think about our um, tiger genus, we draw in one circle, so within, but it's not the only genus within that group. So we've put the other genus as well, which is our genus for the clouded leopard in. Okay, so, that's the first mark point for having two groups within this um, family. And then the second mark point is for drawing within there, within each of those groups, the species and labeling them. So that's what we should have for a correct answer. Okay, other ways the examiner asks. So here's another one for you, fill in the gap and name the class and the family to which the horse and the donkey both belong. Okay, so have a go and pause. Okay, so I'm going to go through. So again, sign at Kingdom. Now you'll find a lot of your exam questions in your question pack, etc. We'll begin with Kingdom and that's because um domain was only added to the specification with the new spec so um kingdom was the the highest grouping the biggest grouping um that we used to teach so a lot of the old questions won't have domain on but they'll be exactly the same uh, the questions just with another light level on top another uh, larger grouping on top so <coughs> kingdom phylum class order family genus species so keep repeating it get a, a, a way of memorizing that sequence and then they were both class mammals and the equina um, family so as long as you knew your sequence you could pull that data okay time for another task so can I ask you to pause the video have a go at this Okay, so you're filling in the gaps and giving us the class and family to which the horse and the donkey belong. Okay, I'm going to go through. So if you're not ready, wait, pause now. Okay, so filling in the gaps. Phylum, class, order, family, genus. 
and in terms of class and family so you're just reading across them so mammal mammalia and aquini there we go okay so uh, a few questions now okay so into your question pack so the first question in your question pack is one of these representations of the hierarchical structure with a sort of circle representing or well not circle a shape representing the largest group and then within that shape subdivided into the next grouping and then subdivided again into the next grouping so taxon a is split into two groups taxon b's yeah so this is another level in the hierarchy and then one of them is further split into two groups and the other into one so it says for the first question explain which of these levels of classification could not be first genus and then phylum so let's remind ourselves of where genus is so genus has only one grouping below phylum depending on how they represent it to you um, has kingdom and domain above so that's on the new specification kingdom and domain um, okay so um which one could not be genus then okay well if you think about taxon a it's got two groupings below it so a could not be a genus because you'd go genus species and then there's no level below okay so that one's quite a good one to do now with phylum that's a bit more difficult I mean, again, phylum couldn't be A because uh, phylum's uh, got two groups above. Um, it couldn't be B either because it's got two groups above. Okay. So, anything like that with this. So, part A, tax on A. It uh, couldn't be genus. Genus has only species or one level. Um, and it also has taxon above it, so it has groups above it. For the phylum one, say maybe A or B because of the number um, of levels above it. Okay. In the mark scheme originally, I think um, because domain wasn't on. I've just added an or depending on if you look they've given not given domain in there um, and they're expecting you to put them in order and then apply them to this diagram but on the new spec there would be domain listed too so that's why I've got an or in but you're basically saying the ones that haven't got enough above them give two features that are characteristic of the kingdom fungi so you're only supposed to know a couple of characteristics of the kingdoms based on your cell knowledge so it's only applied knowledge uh, on the new specification but I did mention one other that you might have picked up on earlier in the video so the idea it's got a chitin cell wall that's on your spec that's something you learned in your cells topic Hyphae and the fact that these hyphae are multinucleate, that's something that I gave you in the video. So on the new specification, you're not required to know that, but I thought I would give you that information. It's a bit of extra spec uh, for your essay. Okay. So moving on to question two in the question pack. Okay, have a go at this one on your own now and then join me back. Okay, so this is another way the examiner can explore if you understand this hierarchical system. The idea that you've got bigger groups into which smaller groups sit. Because if you've got two group, two organisms and they're in the same class, then they have to share the same phylum, kingdom, domain. 
<clears throat> so you know everything above that green pink they would share so that's really mm -hmm. what this question is based on so looking for the cheetah and the lion and the only thing we've been given really is the uh the names the order and the family so if we know they're in the same order they're in the same family okay but we can see they're in different genii i mean different genus from their names okay we can go for anything that they share so um other than family and order so you can pick anything above okay so the same class the same phylum the same kingdom the same domain domains included as well now on the new spec don't share well if you look then it's everything below isn't it so we've got a different genus and a different species name okay moving on to question three do you want to pause this this shows how they use the classification to review something you know about the um, kingdoms related to cells okay so and then this is old spec so of course domain would be here as well and again it's just can you remember the taxonomic groupings in the right order okay so stop have a go and then rejoin to review okay so you should be ready to review now so <clears throat> looking at the table for the animal cell it does have mitochondria of course it doesn't have a cell wall does have ribosomes and does not have a large permanent vacuole plant cell has mitochondria, a cellular cell wall, ribosomes and a large central vacuole so we want to tick in each of those. For a prokaryote the only one that you've got ticked is ribosomes. Remember they've not said anything about the size so it contains 70s ribosomes so it does contain ribosomes. Its cell wall does not contain cellulose that's why we haven't got a tick here and of course it has no membrane bound organelles. So we should have three marks. It does say put a cross in the box if the structure is not present. If you've just ticked, then just watch that you are following instructions. Okay, give another structure not shown in the table, which is present in the cells of organisms in the kingdom, fungi, prokaryotes, and protoctista. Okay so you have to think of something that is in eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells so it's really application of cell knowledge so i would have gone for cell surface membrane other than that you've really got chromosomes or genes they've accepted but really that's what they expected everybody to write that all those cells have a cell surface membrane I'm sorry if you can hear crinkling in the background. We've bought the dog a new dog toy and she's currently playing with it. Okay, so in terms of your sequence then, kings and phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So filling those in in the correct order gets you a mark. Okay, moving on to question four. Okay, so again, you've got gaps to fill in, including this side here. So if you want the genus and you want the species, you need to look to the name. Okay, so I'll complete the table and then have a look with me. Okay, so you should have completed the table. That one should be nice and easy now. We should be getting really familiar with that order. For a genus, genus is the first part of the name. Species is the second part of the name. So we're just copying those in. That's a really popular style of question just for two marks on our exam. My answer there didn't mean it to be there so far. Okay, so the next one says, this system of classification is described as hierarchical. I explain what is meant by a hierarchical classification. Okay, so as you can see, I've already showed the answer. Okay, so we're looking for larger groups containing smaller groups because it's a one mark answer. If you had any more marks to play with there, 
then you can expand on this saying that there's no overlap between the groups as an extra mark point. Okay, so despite differences in form, leopards, tigers and lions are classified as different species in the same genus. Cheetahs, although similar in form to leopards, are classified as a different genus. Okay, and the question that I've missed off, I just had to look up, um, describe one way in which different species may be distinguished. Okay, so how would you distinguish between different species? Okay, so there's two ways. I'm hoping you've got something like this now written. Um, you can try to breed them, okay, and they won't, um, they want them to breed to produce fertile offspring, or you can compare base sequences of genes in their DNA. And if they're the same species, the base sequence will be the same or incredibly similar. So hardly any variation at all. Okay, so moving on to the next question. Suggest other two other sources of evidence which scientists may have used to classify leopards into different uh, genii. So, having to think then about other things we could compare, there's a lot here, okay? We're going to move on to this again in a moment. Uh, <clears throat> so, we may have looked at the fossil record, okay? So, we might have looked at uh, evolutionary history or the thiogenetics, so that is, differences and similarities in the base sequence of their DNA or the amino acid sequences of their proteins. We can look at common shared, so this is homologous features, these are common features, things like uh, we said with um, us and our close family, uh, we've got opposable thumbs, so you know there's features of that family, that genus, that species that we could use. Um, the number of chromosomes, okay, so they accepted a lot of different ideas here, anything you could use to see whether or not two organisms are uh, similar enough to be categorised um, in the same or different groups. Okay, right, so back into your keynotes, we're going to think about that a little bit more as we'll have a look at uh, thiogenetics. So back into our keynote. So we've had a look now through all the classification system um, and we've done lots of exam question practice on that section. So we are moving on to page six at the bottom where it says thiogenetics. This is the study of patterns of evolutionary history. Okay. So, well, I'll do the introduction from your keynotes, actually. So it says, all organisms evolved from shared common ancestors, organisms which have shared the same common ancestor more recently, are said to have been more closely related than those who shared the same common ancestor less recently. We can display this evolutionary relationship in a thiogenetic tree, so like the one in your keynotes there. You, I know you've seen these before because I've seen some GCSE exam questions with these kinds of trees in. Um, so, organisms which shared a, say, the common ancestor more recently have branches, um, which if you are reading from, this is current species, going back into the past, if they share a branch earlier, then they had a common ancestor at that point in history. So more recently, and so C and D are more closely related. Okay, so let's have a look at my uh, example here. So if we are classifying um, organisms, putting them into species groupings, and then seeing how closely related those groupings are, those species groupings are, by um, assessing how recently they shared a common ancestry in time 
Okay, so which of these groups of R relatives uh, are, the, are the ones that are closest to us? Okay, and who's the most closely related to the bonon, bon, bonono, bonon, oh, oh, can I say it? Yeah, it's this group. <laughs> okay, so if you think about our evolutionary history, if we go back, the first group actually that we shared a common ancestor with is the uh, these these two groups here the ancestor that went on to be the ancestor of the chimps and the banana banana bo, nobos on nobos um who's the closest related to the bonobos uh, it's the chimps okay so that's the kind of question you know the uh, interpretation that we might have to do with phylogenetic trees Okay, so this is the one from your keynotes. So C and D are most closely related. Uh, we have to go back quite a long time before we hit a common ancestor for A and D, and A and C and B and A are more closely related than A and D. So this is a GCSE question. So that's how I kind of know that you've seen these before. Um, <clears throat> The diagram shows an evolutionary tree, so they, we call them thiogenetic trees, for the great apes. So you can see the same arrangement, and you can see that um, here is our common ancestor with the chimpanzees, and then if you go back further in time with the gorillas. So these are our closest relatives. <clears throat> how many years ago, uh, after, how many years after gorillas did the humans, the hominids, uh, evolve? So we've got to go and read the scale, okay, and we've got a difference there of 3 million years, and then it says which animal in the diagram is the most distant relatives of chimpanzees, so we've got to go follow the line back to the, uh, from the most distant, which is the orangutans. Okay, so here's another example. Okay, so this is an A-level example now. So I'd like you to have a go at this one. Okay, so this one's not in your question pack. So have a go at this one, pause the video and come back. Okay, so first question. How many um, genii are there? So... You're looking at the first name, aren't you? So we've got one. So there are two, three, four, five, six. Okay. All the seals shown in the diagram are members of this group in here. Uh, which taxonomic group is it? Okay, so this is our species. This is our genus. So we're going back up our taxon taxonomic groupings. Okay, so the next one's got to be family. Okay. Next one, the diagram is based on the evolutionary history of seals. What does the information in the diagram suggest about the common ancestors of? So then we need to find them, don't we? So we've got that one. We've got that one. And that one. Okay, so we're looking for two species that shared a common ancestor more recently than the this species here so if we go they had the most shared a common ancestor most recently okay and the point at which they shared a common ancestor with this species is further back in time okay a species of seal shows genetic diversity. I explain what is meant by genetic diversity. So a bit of a, a throwback to the previous topic. So differences in DNA or base sequences of DNA, different alleles in the population, different alleles of genes, so different ways of writing it. That's what genetic diversity is. 
okay so there will be genetic diversity within a species okay differences in dna based sequences however that difference is not as significant as it would be between two different quite closely related species and that's how we can use dna to uh, group organisms okay so have a look now at the question pack question five okay so the galapagos are a very isolated group of islands species of birds called finches live in these islands scientists think that the different species have evolved from a population of species which managed to reach the islands thousands of years ago from south america scientists used base sequences in the dna of the finches to work out the evolutionary relationship of these species so they compared the base species uh, the base sequences of dna for certain genes and they would have found that those organisms they've put into the same genome had more similarities than those that were then placed um, into the same uh, family grouping okay <clears throat> and so on so um, the diagram shows the evolutionary relationship large differences in base sequences are shown by lower vertical lines so because this is a graph a chart you can actually depict how different the sequences were by giving a bigger length to this line here so um, if you think about um, just sorry just think about this genus here and this genus here they are equally different to this family yeah so the differences from this common ancestor in the base sequences are the same for both branches but you can see then that there is a difference between we're comparing this organism here and this organism here because they are in different uh, genii and the, there's a difference a greater difference between here and here than here and here okay so it gives us that extra information okay so can you have a go then at the questions in the question pack and then rejoin me to go through. Okay, so going through now. So, which present day species evolved first? How many genera? Uh, which two are most closely related? Uh, and other than DNA base sequences, what other kind of evidence can we use for these evolutionary relationships? Sorry about the dog. Uh, <clears throat> other than DNA then, what could we use? Well, we could use sh shared characteristics of anatomy and morphology. Uh, we can use other biochemistry, so comparing amino acid sequences in proteins. We could use fossil evidence. You can look, there's also behaviour in there and using embryology. So lots of different ways uh, organisms, can, information can be sought out to classify organisms and find out how closely related they are to each other. However, our default now is base sequences of DNA. Okay, so it's become something of a science of its own phylogenetic classification so this is where we just use dna base sequences and make a good comparison between them um or it doesn't have to be base sequence but it has to be something based on base sequence so it can be amino acid sequences or tertiary structure of proteins or even behavior because that is determined by dna okay but we do tend to usually now go for DNA based sequences okay so we'll come back to that we're going to just go away slightly for a moment um, because 
we're going to just have a look at this section um, in our keynotes, which is about courtship behaviour. Okay. And then we'll come back to modern classification methods. So, in your keynotes, that section on court, courtship behaviour. Now, the first thing you really is this is, it's kind of slotted in here because you can use courtship behaviour as a way of classifying organisms into the groupings we've been talking about because courtship behaviour is species specific, okay? So although for us it's quite difficult to understand, um, when you look at the courtship behaviour of things like insects and birds, it is actually predetermined by their DNA. And we can see that because they, um, there are very specific sequences of movement patterns um, within a, a species of bird or a species of insect which are completely unique to that species. Okay, so they can be really useful as a way of classifying species according to their behaviour. Okay, but in the exa our example, what they really, really like about this bit is giving you data about courtship behaviour and asking you why it's so important to a species to display um, such specific courtship behaviour. So we're going to kind of look at it in two lights in that way. So courtship behaviour is carried out by organisms to attract a mate of the right species. The right species being the same species as them so that they can interbreed and produce fertile offspring and so ensure successful mating. Courtship behaviour is genetically determined so organisms that are more closely related display similar patterns of courtship behaviour. Therefore, we can use this um, to classify organisms as well. So the exam board's got two things they want you to know about. Why courtship behaviour is important to the species and how we can use it to determine if one group of species uh, is similar to another or not. So we'll do both, okay? So that's really important to get into your head, is that this behaviour we're talking about is completely genetically um, determined. So it is not learnt behaviour. So there are three little videos, if you go into the PowerPoint, of different bird courtship uh, displays, which are quite fun to watch. Okay, so they're just linked in there if you go into the PowerPoint. Um, there are some lovely insect ones as well. So you can, if you Google um, insect courtship behaviour, you have to be very careful when Googling these things. Um, but there is um, some spiders that uh, have very, very strange displays. Um, and scientists have, made, have been able to immobilise the spiders so you can watch um, the display. Okay, so determined by genes enables the organism to recognize members of its own species yeah so remember only the same species will produce fertile offspring so that's really important we don't have to waste energy trying to reproduce with an organism that we can't uh, produce fertile offspring with to identify and make capable of breeding okay so these displays are only made by organisms when they are capable of breeding when they are sexually mature. So in other words, that um, the organism will display that courtship behaviour if it is able to reproduce. Um, it can also facilitate per bonding in some species and that can increase the success of mating and also the su success of the offspring surviving. So if it cements per bonding, this display, then it may mean that uh, organisms, there's two organisms looking after the offspring and they'll be more likely to survive. And it can also synchronise the mating, so it synchronises mating so that gametes are released at the same time. And that would increase the probability of the gametes being fertilised. Now, of course, these are all, sub uh, all specific to 
the scenario you're given by the example. So they will give you in the stem some reasons for this particular species why courtship behaviour um, helps them to reproduce successfully. So don't just learn them as a rote list. There are ideas that you can draw from the stem. The examiner will hint one way or the other that they want you to what they want you to talk about. Okay, so let's have a look at some fireflies. So uh, when fireflies are displaying that they are ready to mate, they um, produce a pattern of lights. Uh, <clears throat> so you can look at these are one, two, three, four five six different species of firefly and you can see that each one's got a unique pattern to its courtship display in terms of the way it flashes the lights okay so the examiner might give you some information like that a diagram like that and they would say use this diagram so use figure whatever to explain how different courtship behavior um, facilitate successful mating okay so you would talk about there being different light patterns for each of the species and that would ensure that species A only attracted mates of the same species species A yeah uh, because all the other patterns are different okay the examiner could also give you data like that and say, suggest which species you think are most closely related. So if the species are more closely related, then the DNA based sequences will be more similar. That would mean that their behavior during courtship would also be more similar. So you'd be looking for similarities in the frequency and pattern of the light shows. So you might suggest um, that the pattern A and not A, sorry C, I'm doing C, so it's a long burst is similar to in terms of frequency to E and that might be your justification for saying why you think they're most closely related or you might compare some of the others. Okay there's a lot of long delay between light displays for F and, but they are really long. So you might be drawing for similarities and differences. Okay, so I'm gonna show you some examples of that. You've got one in your keynote. Okay, so this is the head bobbing behavior of two fenced lizards. So this is their courtship behavior and this is their display um, during courtship. Okay, and it's different even though they are very closely related, they're in the same genus. Okay, so what you would do is you would look at the data and you would say, right, these are pretty similar groups, they're in the same genus, but they're two separate species. So the similarities are uh, within the two second interval, both species complete three head bobs. So that's why they're in the same genus, it's very similar. However, they are two separate species because this one raises its head higher and only returns its head back to the original height above the ground following three head bobs whereas the other species does not raise its head as high and returns to the same original height above ground following each head bob okay so we're talking about being that specific in your descriptions when you're comparing courtship behavior so this is important because it will mean that if one of these lizards met one of these lizards and they displayed their courtship behavior they would not uh, try to reproduce with each other because their courtship patterns would not be recognized <clears throat> as being the right species whereas if two individuals of the same species displayed then of course that pattern will be recognized as being the same species and they would reproduce. Okay, so here is an old exam question. 
And this is the kind of data set you end up with. Okay, so you get <clears throat> some sort of representation of a sequence of movements or events. So we've got two males, okay, closely related fruit flies, so but different species. They're closely related, but not the same species. The numbers show the probability of one courtship element following another. So for species A, when it orientates to the, the female, its first courtship element that it displays is scissor wings. Okay. When it's done that scissor wings, some of them vibrate wings and some go back and redo. Following the vibration of the wings, most then lick the female and attempt to mate. So you can see that pattern. In species B, following orientation to the female, the majority goes straight to vibration of wings. Okay, so you can see that that pattern is different. So in the exam question, that's exactly what you were asked. You were asked the same question as this. Can you give data to support the, state, the statement that these are two separate species that are quite shared a common ancestor quite recently. So in the same way, in this exam question, you had to say they are similar species and that shared a common ancestor very recently because if you look, the courtship um, elements are the same. So scissor wings, vibrate wings, lick female. So however, the sequence of those and the probability of one following the other is different in those two groupings and so that shows that they are two separate species although they shared a common ancestor fairly recently. Okay so that was the original question. Okay so back into your question pack then and we're on question six. So this is a new spec one. <clears throat> okay so the diagram shows the seahorse. The seahorse is a fish. Mating in seahorses begins with courtship behaviour. After this, the female transfers her unfertilised eggs into the male's pouch. Most male fish fertilise eggs that have been released into the sea. However, a male seahorse fertilises eggs while they're inside his pouch. The fertilised eggs stay there and develop into young seahorses. Okay, then it says... Give two ways in which courtship behaviour increases the probability of successful mating. So pause here and give that a go. Okay, so you're ready to have a look at the answer. Okay, so some of the things we said in that opening. Recognition of the same species, I hope you've all got that. Okay, um, recognition of the opposite gender you can have as well. So. Um, in this case, males um, do the courtship behaviour and attract females. Um, stimulate the release of gametes at the same time and also only happen during sexual maturity or fertility. So have you got those kind of ideas? So they're going to be general ideas you can use always. Okay. <clears throat> now, these are horse, seahorse specific. And these come from the question itself. So give one way in which the uh, which reproduction in seahorses increases the probability of fertilization for one mark and then survival of young seahorses. So go back to the stem as you're doing this and use the information you're given. Okay, ready to go through? Okay, fertilization. Well, it was internal fertilization, so within the pouch. Okay. Um, that's much more likely to work than gametes having to fuse in the water. Okay, so gametes are more likely to fuse together, fertilization is more likely to occur because it's inside the pouch. So it doesn't have to be these words, you could have described it from the stem. Yeah, that the female's gametes are added to the pouch and then the male fertilizes them while they're inside the pouch. 
survival of the young seahorses well they stay inside the pouch till development rather than swimming around and that protects them from predators okay moving on to the next part of the question so scientists investigated the effect of total body length on the selection of a mate in one Australian species of seahorse. The scientists used head length as a measurement of total body length. Okay, so this is now a how science works question. Okay, so we're kind of moving off topic slightly, but this is the kind of thing that our examiner likes to ask about. So use the diagram to suggest why scientists measured head length rather than total body length. So they want you to look at the diagram okay so if i go head length compared to total body length what might be difficult about that and is this about proportional do you think let's have a think okay so this is what i would have gone with the body is curved and the head's linear so i'm going to get less error trying to measure the head but you could also talk about uncurling the tail, causing it more stress handling the seahorse more if you had to measure the body. So it's quicker, more accurate to measure the head. More accurate because you've got less error because it's linear, I think is stronger. So just why the scientists were able to use head length as a measure of total body length? Well, it must be proportional. Okay, the head length must be proportional to body length. Otherwise, that wouldn't work. Okay. So they measured the head lengths of females and males in a number of pairs, and, as, and the results are shown in the graph. Hmm. So it looks like there is a positive correlation there, doesn't it, between the head length of the male and the female in the pairs. The scientists concluded that total body length affects the selection of mates. Explain how the results support this conclusion. Okay, so have a go answering before you unpause me. <clears throat> okay, so as we said, there's a positive correlation. You have to be more detailed than that. You have to say there's a positive correlation between the head length of males and females within the same purring. That would indicate that they have similar body lengths in each purr. And so they are selecting a mate with a similar length body to themselves. A female with a head of 50 millimetres selected a mate. Explain how you would use the graph to predict the total head length of the mate selected. So we go to our graph and we go, oh, we've got no data here at all. So how can we use this graph? Well, we're going to have to use the data and extrapolate the trend to that 50 millimetre mark. And once we've done that, we can then use a ruler to go up to our extrapolated line and see where we come out. Okay, sorry, it's the other way around, isn't it? So 50 and see where we come out for the male. So um, use a line of best fit, extrapolate, exam, exa, extend the line and then read it off. Okay, potentially for another mark point you could have just jumped to well compare their dna but i don't think that's a valid mark point really i think you should be using the data and following the guidance of the examiner and that's where the answer would come okay so that is our courtship behavior although there are some other courtship behavior questions coming up in homeworks and things to do a bit more consolidation on that we're back to the phylogenetic classification and that was because towards the end of your student notes we've got a little bit more detail about modern classification methods okay so we'll just bob into that section of your keynotes okay so modern classification methods it can be difficult to decide which species an organism belongs to or if it's a new distinct species. This is because you don't always observe their reproductive behaviour. You can't tell if they're fertile, or, um, the offspring are fertile and they might be extinct. 
um, they might produce reproduce asexually there might be practical or ethical issues about defining them as a species by trying to get them to breed together <coughs> so originally classification systems were just based on observable uh, features and the hierarchy uh, classification of organisms led to mistakes when they were just based on common um, observable what they call homologous features because some species do look similar to each other because they've evolved in the same kind of environment but they don't really share a common ancestor very recently so now we basically rely on genetic and molecular evidence to produce the phylogenetic trees that we've talked about earlier okay and to classify organisms and we have reclassified a number of organisms into uh, at different levels of that taxonomic system because we thought they were in one grouping and then we did dna analysis and we've regrouped them so this is a bit weird on the new spec on the old spec you needed to know how we did all of this on the new spec they just want you to know that we make three types of comparison so this is your AO1 okay we make comparisons in terms of biochemistry of the base sequence of DNA the base sequence of mRNAs the amino acid sequence of proteins and it's those biochemical investigations that we use to then group organisms in the taxonomic hierarchy and also to create the phylogenetic relationship trees that we've been looking at. Again, where the length of the lines in the trees can depict how similar or different an organism is. So the longer it is, the more different the base sequence under investigation is or amino acid sequence etc so more different the organism the greater the number of differences in one of these molecules that's been investigated okay now the exam board seems to be sticking to dna so i'm going to show you an example of that now but then i'm going to tell you a little bit more um information so that if they do do some ao2 questions that i know you could create from some of the information that was on the old spec um, and they could call it application rather than a knowledge we're going to do some of that too okay so our phylogenetic classification so our genetic classification is based on modern classification methods where we compare the base sequence of dna molecules or the base sequence of rna molecules or the amino acid sequences of proteins because they are determined obviously by the dna base sequence and species then we said we can put them into groups in the taxonomic hierarchy based on similarities and differences in those bases or amino acid sequences and again the length of the line between or on the branch can depict how similar so it would be shorter the more similar or longer the more different okay so so far this is all we've had in terms of assessment on the new spec this and a thiogenetic tree, which is in your keynotes, not keynotes, in your question pack. So, <clears throat> table two shows part of a nucleotide sequence in a gene in populations of tigers living in different parts of the world. Okay, so that's the information they gave. You can see that two of those base sequences are identical and one is different. And it says, explain what the information in table two suggests about the phylogenetics. So we're concentrating on similarities or differences in the base sequence between these two tigers. And we can represent that in a phylogenetic tree as well. Well, what do you think? Well, what we're looking for is identifying that the two with the identical base sequence should a more recent common ancestor the more closely related compared to 
the Siberian tiger, which had this different two bases in that base sequence. Okay, so we could have said the converse. We could have said the Siberian tiger is less closely related to the other two. We had to say both of them though, because obviously they're very closely related. For the second mark point, it was because these two are identical base sequences and this one has two base differences. So it's making sure you put that detail in. And some students in the exam drew this for the examiner and they liked that, showing that the Siberian tiger is, is less closely related to the other two in a phylogenetic tree. They could then now, because they said they liked that, ask for students to do that next time. Okay, so in your keynotes, you've got another example with some whales. Okay, so here's your phylogenetic tree, and here you can see uh, the comparison of base sequences. Okay, so you can look through there and look for the amount of similarity, the amount of difference, and kind of compare it to the tree. Okay, so. <clears throat> Um, the other thing that the examiner can do is something quite simple like this, where they do the same thing, but for a protein. So proteins we know are made from amino acids. The sequence of those amino acids is coded for by the gene um, in the DNA. So related organisms have similar DNA based sequences. And so the amino acid sequences of their proteins will be similar too. So if you have a look at this example here, this is what the examiner could give you. They could give you a comparison of amino acid sequences, just like they did in this example with DNA. And you'd be looking for similarities and differences. So in this example, uh, we've said A and B are the most closely related because there are fewer differences between those, them and more similarities in the rest of the group. Okay. Now, the examiner said you do kind of have to know about immunological comparisons as well, but they didn't say you needed to know any detail, just that you could use them, okay? But I think you need to understand it because it could easily be application of your immunology knowledge. So what I'm going to take you through now is a bit of opportunity the examiner has for getting you to apply your, apply your knowledge of DNA based sequences, primary structures of proteins and tertiary structures of proteins in the immune response. So in other words, these are modern methodologies used to classify species, um, but they are not written as A01 that you need to wrote, learn them. Um, I always think if there's a possibility that it comes up as application, it's better to at least just have a little look at it and you'll see that quite a few of these are in the revision guide. The DNA hybridization methodology seems to be in a lot of them, even though it's not named on the specification that you really need to know that method, how that method works. So I'm going to talk you through each one of these methods. Um, again, this is just AO2 though. Okay, so getting you ready for potential opportunities for application in the exam. So, so the examiner knows you know a lot about DNA structure. Okay, so if they fed you a little bit of information about this methodology, you should be able to interpret the results. So I'm going to do a bit of a stem with you now as if this was an exam question. So imagine the examiner says to you, they were comparing the species A and B in this experiment to see how similar or different the base sequence of their DNA was. But instead of actually determining the base sequence by genome sequencing, they use this method of base sequence comparison called DNA hybridization. So what you do is you break your DNA uh, hydrogen bonds so you unzip your molecules okay and then you take one strand from species A and you take the other strand from species B and you mix those together and you cool it down now if there is a complementary base pair at that position 
a new hydrogen bond will form. But if the base sequence was different at that, at that particular position, it won't be complementary and hydrogen bonds will not form at that position. So because they are fairly closely related, the majority of the DNA, when you take one strand from species A and the other strand from species B and mix them together, if this is just in a test tube, will actually bind by a complementary base pairing for most of the molecule. There'll just be a few gaps where the base sequence was different. Obviously, if they're very different species, then those places, those gaps where hydrogen bonds won't form because what's found on this strand is not complementary in base to that strand because they've got a different base sequence, more differences. Um, you'll have fewer and fewer hydrogen bonds, the less and less related the species are. Okay, so the examiner would explain that in a stem, just like I have, and give you a diagram like this, because it's application. Okay, and so they might show you a picture like this. So this is the original DNA, okay, species A. And then this is a hybrid of species A's DNA with another species and a second species. So um, if we imagine that says human DNA, We've heated it up and we've kept one of the strands, this top one here, and then we mix it with a orangutan DNA. And that's, we're quite closely related to orangutans. So that DNA would, that second strand would bind quite well. You get quite a lot of hydrogen bonding. Um, but then say this was um, a spider monkey, less closely related to us. You can see this green strand this is the human strand in black you've got less hydrogen bonds so it's this idea that depending how closely related the two species that you're mixing there will be more or less hydrogen bonds more hydrogen bonds if they're more closely related and less if they're not closely related so then what you do in this experiment is you just heat them up okay so Let's imagine I had done this experiment with human and human, okay, so that should give us 100% uh, matching base pairs, and so all the hydrogen um, bonds present. Repeat the experiment with a DNA hybrid molecule containing one strand human bound to one strand gorilla, where not all the bases would have been pairs, and so not all the hydrogen bonds would be present. And then repeat the experiment with one human strand and one chimpanzee strand. Again, there wouldn't be a perfect match. There would be hydrogen bonding because they're very similar species and most bases would pair between those two uh, single strands, but um, not all of them. Okay, so then when we heat up the DNA, to separate these hybrid strands again, we can monitor the temperature at which they finally unzip. So the human DNA, which is completely complementary in both strands and has the maximum number of hydrogen bonds, has to be heated more strongly to break all those hydrogen bonds. Whereas it doesn't take as much to break the hydrogen bonds in these two hybrid DNA molecules because human with gorilla hasn't got all the hydrogen bonds that human and human has and human with chimp uh, chimpanzee again. So let's have a look at the data, which is the most closely related species and why? Well, the higher the temperature, the more closely related because the higher the temperature, the more hydrogen bonds. So human, and chimpanzees are more closely related than humans and gorillas. The evidence is we had to heat the human chimpanzee hybrid DNA to a higher temperature to break all the hydrogen bonds. Therefore, there were more hydrogen bonds and so more complementary base pairs between those two strands. The DNA base sequence was more similar. Okay, in contrast, a bit lower temperature with the gorilla so although still quite fairly closely related not as closely related as we are to chimpanzees 
and that's because we had to heat the uh, sorry we didn't have to heat the DNA to a, as high a temperature to break all the hydrogen bonds so there must have been fewer of them therefore less complementary base pairs and um, um, less similar base sequence okay so now moving on to protein sequence. Uh, so again, as I've shown you in your keynotes, we can look at the similarities and differences in the amino acid sequences of proteins taken from different species. If two species shared a common ancestor more frequently, sorry, more recently, more recently, then they would have more amino acids the same in more positions in that chain okay so it's a case of going through and totting up how many similarities and how many differences and then using that evidence to suggest which species are most closely related as we said in the keynotes it's shown um, species a and b in this one okay now a bit more tricky then if we're asked to um, apply our knowledge to immunological comparisons it comes down to the fact that if species are more closely related they will have proteins with their primary structures that are more similar if their primary structures are more similar that will mean the tertiary structure of their proteins is a more similar shape a more similar tertiary structure three-dimensional structure Therefore, if we use immunology, we can compare species because the shape of the proteins, the antigen, if you like, self-antigen on the cells, will be more similar to more closely related species than to species that didn't share a common ancestor very recently. So let me show you this with this example again don't panic if this takes a few times through it's a really difficult concept and the exam board would give you all of this information because it's AO2 not knowledge so you're not expected to learn and remember this just interpreting it so I'm going to take some protein from a human okay so take a blood sample from uh, David Atta, he's very keen to be involved in any sort of biological experiment. And then we'll inject it into a mouse or rabbit and let the mouse and rabbit do all the hard work of having an immune response to the protein on the surface of the human cells. Okay, so if you think about this, we've taken some, um, some serum from the blood so all the blood proteins will be certain shapes on the surface of the cells uh, will be certain shapes and now the bunny rabbit is having an immune response to those foreign proteins because they're human proteins and making antibodies so now i can take the antibodies from the rabbit okay <coughs> and I can take serum from each of these three species okay so blood serum so I take some blood serum from the dog and mix that with antibodies the rabbit has made to the human proteins and I repeat that experiment for the orangutan yeah so take its blood serum and mix it with antibodies that had been made to human proteins and the same for the chimpanzee okay so here i've got all my mix and as my standard to compare it with i've gone back to my human i've taken a sample of their serum and mixed it with the antibodies from the rabbit okay so in each of these i have got serum from the blood mixed with an anti-human antibody so the rabbits made those for us okay now if the antibodies bind to the antigen they will cause agglutination and a precipitate will form so you'll get like precipitation okay 
So let's have a look at our results, mix them together. And you can see our standard, our human with humans, got the maximum agglutination because, of course, the human blood serum will contain more human proteins that will be bound to by the anti-human antibodies we made using our rabbit. But the next most chimpanzee, so most closely related species to us with that data, the chimpanzee, next closest the orangutan and the least closely related the dog. Okay, right. So last question, just to summarize all the different ways that we can investigate uh, biological molecules to see if two species are closely related or not. Give yourself some time to give a really detailed response here. Okay, and then come back and review. Right, so ready for the review? It's massive. So we could go simply at base sequence comparison. So we could just do um, an, a base sequence on each species DNA and compare the base sequences. Or we could use that DNA hybridization method and you might describe that a little bit. Okay, uh, so separating the strands, breaking the hydrogen bonds, um, making, mixing them together so that you've got these hybrid molecules and then using heat to separate the hybrid strands and how you'd interpret that information. Or you could compare proteins in terms of the primary structure, or we could also compare them in terms of the tertiary structure using immunological comparison. So using those anti antibodies produced by the rabbit to one species and then mixing them with the proteins taken from different species. Uh, so you can see there's some little information about that there as well. Okay, and it's the amount of precipitation then that would indicate the relationship, more precipitation, more closely related. And that's between the protein and the anti uh, bodies. Okay, so that is it for this particular video. Okay, so we've actually finished now the topic material for topic 16. So you need to complete your student uh, question pack revision questions at the back and check them against the mark scheme to finish off your booklet. Um, and we also have a spot test this week as well, which I've sent to you, which you need to complete. So do some revision and review prior to that spot test. Okay. And then the next video is on our correlation coefficient but I've got a little quizzy at the beginning of that as well uh, based on what we've covered in this video. All right.